What's going on guys and welcome back to WWE Network and Chill where I Graham Jesus and Matthews break down all the original content I watch on the WWE Network. Today we're talking the latest edition of WWE The Day Of, focusing on Elimination Chamber 2020, which feels like an absolute eternity ago. I know this was only three weeks ago, I think, from this coming Sunday, but it feels a lot longer than that because this was right before the world went to shit. I think the pay-per-view was on Sunday and then we found out Wednesday that this coronavirus outbreak was a lot worse than originally anticipated. So, as a result, they actually moved the PC right after this. Had this whole thing happened a week earlier, we would probably not have this day of. We would not have had Elimination Chamber, I would have to imagine. I can't imagine they would tape Elimination Chamber at the PC. I'm not even sure it would fit. Watching this back almost makes me feel nostalgic for the show, as weird as that sounds, for three weeks ago. And again, this wasn't even a month ago. This was merely three weeks ago. But my, how much has changed in that time. I know we were complaining about, oh, you know, the crowd wasn't all that into Gulak and Brian. Hey, fuck, at least there was a crowd. I'll take that over what we're getting with WrestleMania pre-recorded in an empty arena any day of the week. Any day of the week. And quite honestly, even at the time I said this, I did not mind this show. For a three, three and a half hour event, for what it was, I enjoyed it. It was far from memorable. There's probably a lot of things that happened on the show you probably don't even remember, despite the fact that it happened three weeks ago, outside of the two chamber matches. And even those weren't entirely memorable. But for what I was expecting from the show and the build being as lackluster as it was, I thought this was a solid show. So I enjoyed watching this back. Uh, the first person that we hear from is John Morrison, who said that the last Elimination Chamber match he had been in was nine years ago. At Elimination Chamber 2011, I remember this very vividly. Um, I don't know how many Chamber matches he had been in, at least two. I know he was in that last one in 2011. It was the number one contenders match for the WWE Championship, the winner facing The Miz for the title at WrestleMania 27. He was in there with Sheamus, Cena, Punk, Orton, and... not Was it R-Truth? I feel like R-Truth was in there too. I don't... Mm, maybe not. Yeah, I feel like he was. I don't remember. Yeah, I think it was R-Truth, Punk, Sheamus, and then Morrison, Cena, and Orton, if I'm not mistaken. I've seen that match back so many times because I love that show. And he actually stood out in a major way during that match. He wasn't the first one eliminated. I think he actually did something similar to Lince Dorado in that match, albeit not as impressive when he fell off the top of the chamber. I think he landed right on top of, um, landed right on top of Sheamus, eliminated him, then I think Punk pinned Morrison soon after that. but And I think he was in the Chamber match a year before that as well in 2010 uh, for the SmackDown's World Heavyweight Championship. He may or may not have been in one prior to that, but I don't think so. So anyway, he says, oh, I only have good memories from this match. And I almost won too, but I didn't. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I guess he kind of came close to winning in 2011. Not really. It's not like he was one of the last ones in there. I mean, he was. He was among the final three. He wasn't among the final two. But like I said, he did perform pretty well in the match, from what I can recall. Uh, from what I can recall, that is. Uh, we hear from Tucker of Heavy Machinery, who talks about looking for an opportunity in the SmackDown Tag Team Championship Elimination Chamber match. We hear from uh, Peter Rosenberg, who I think returned to WWE on the show. If it wasn't this one, it might have been the pay-per-view before, but that would have been Super Showdown, so it must have been this show. Again, this feels like so long ago. Uh, but Peter Rosenberg's been gone from WWE for a few years. I'm not personally his biggest fan. Um, I don't even think Sam Roberts is all that amazing, although I'm a bigger fan of Sam than I am of Peter Rosenberg. Um, but anyway, so he came back on the show. We hear from him, who calls the night unique because of the implications with WrestleMania hanging in the balance right around the corner. We hear from Shayna Baszler, who we see her looking at the Elimination Chamber structure, and she says, hey, it's different, but a cage is a cage. You know, kind of alluding to the fact that she fought in MMA inside of a, you know, the octagon in the UFC before coming to WWE a few years ago. We hear from Sarah Logan, who was a part of the Raw Women's Championship number one contenders Elimination Chamber match, who says there's a, a lot of unknowns in this match with who else is in it, what it means for her at WrestleMania, and she also talks about the Riot Squad implications, considering that her, Liv Morgan, and Ruby Riot are all in the same match. And she talks about how all of their biggest WWE memories have so far been together as the Riot Squad, and now their biggest memory up to this point in the paper in, in, in a main event of a pay per view is also going to be together, albeit separately as opponents. You know, 
Um, she also talks about how her and Liv actually had the most experience out of anyone. I think they're the only two women at part of this match that have been in the Elimination Chamber match before. She said that, and I'm thinking in my mind, Ruby Riot hasn't. She wasn't a part of it last year or the year before. Um, definitely not Sheena. Obviously, she just got called up. Definitely not Natalia. And um, who else was in it? The Riot Squad girls. Um, yeah, Natalia, Asuka. Was Asuka in a chamber match? I don't think so. Not two years ago, I know that. And I don't think she was in it last year either. I don't even think she was on the show. I mean, if she was, she was probably facing Mandy Rose or some shit. I don't even think she was on the show last year. So, yeah, she's right. Um, her and Liv actually went for the WWE Women's Tag Team Championships. Uh, or, I'm sorry, the WWE Women's Tag Team titles inside the chamber a year ago. So... Anyway, um, uh, we hear also from Sarah Logan who talks about how she kind of feels most comfortable inside situations like this, in situations like this, being a hardcore wrestler. Before coming to WWE, I think her name was Crazy Mary Dobson, and she wrestled in a lot of hardcore extreme matches, you know, like tables, barbed wire. She has done absolutely, absolutely none of that in WWE. And I honestly completely forgot about that until she mentioned it, because the Sarah Logan character was a far cry from what she was doing before as Crazy Mary Dobson. A lot like Dean Ambrose, who, yeah, did some hardcore stuff in WWE, but you would never even know that John Moxley, pre-WWE, and Dean Ambrose in WWE were the same person based off their wrestling styles. Um, so she also talks about, we hear a lot from Sarah Logan on this episode, which is cool. I'm not the biggest Sarah Logan fan, but it's nice to hear from her because we don't really hear from her often. And I mean, rightfully so, her mic skills aren't the greatest, but as a person, it's cool to know, you know, who she is, what her identity is, what she's all about, what she's aiming to accomplish, all that other type of stuff. She also talks about how she stood alone. I, I couldn't believe this when she said this, but she must be right. I mean, she's recalling the story herself that on the final Raw before the pay-per-view was the very first time in her main roster career that she stood in a WWE ring all by herself. And I'm I'm assuming that's not including, like, entrances and win... I mean, she's won matches before on main event, albeit not very many of them. But I think she's talking about during the contract signing when she laid everyone out for a brief moment there, she was the last woman standing. Or maybe it wasn't the contract signing. Maybe it was when... She attacked both Liv and Ruby Riot, But I, I feel like that's happened before. Again, I might be wrong. I know she stood along the Riot Squad members, but even on her own, I feel like we've seen that before, where she stood alone um, without anyone else. You know, she was the last woman standing there for a very brief moment, but I thought it was very cool that she had mentioned that, whether it's true or not. And she also said she feels like she's the one who deserves the most out of anyone to face Becky Lynch for the Raw Women's Championship at WrestleMania. Uh, we hear from Grandma Talik and Lindsay Dorado who reflect on the arena and uh, kind of their personal connection with the arena before they enter the Elimination Chamber to vie for the SmackDown Tag Team titles. Um, Lindsay Dorado says, hey, fans tonight are going to see me sore. And he was not lying. Lindsay Dorado, I'm going to, I, I got to just outright say this. Him and Grandma Talik, people may not give two shits about the Lucha House Party nowadays, but they went in there and had a great showing. They had a really, really good showing inside that chamber. Um, Linso, Lince Dorado specifically, between all the high flying stuff and then falling off the top of the chamber, the flip in midair, that was fucking cool. Um, yeah, I thought he really stood out as not a star in this match, but, um, you know, kind of giving people more of a taste of what he can, what, what he's capable of. We've, we've seen that before on 205 Live, definitely not on Raw or SmackDown, so I thought it was cool that he got the shine on this show. We also hear from the Usos, who want to win gold ahead of WrestleMania, recalling how, I think... They didn't mention 2017, but I think every year, aside from this year, obviously, um, for the last three years, they've walked into WrestleMania as tag team champions. Last year, they defended the SmackDown tag team title successfully at WrestleMania on the main card. Two years ago, they walked in a SmackDown tag team champions to face, what was it, the Bludgeon Brothers and the New Day? Um... The match, I mean, it was entirely forgettable and they lost, but they still walked in as tag team champions. And then I think at 33, they were the tag team champions going into that show as well, but they didn't defend them. I think they were a part of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal instead. And they also walked into WrestleMania 30, yeah, 30 as the tag team champions too on the kickoff show. And they were involved in tag team title matches at 
31 as well, as well as 20. The Usos have a very extensive history at WrestleMania involving those tag team titles, so you could obviously tell why they want to win this match and walk into WrestleMania as the SmackDown Tag Team Champions once again. We hear from Drew Gulak, who talks about how he's never faced Daniel Bryan before, but he's been kind of uh, admiring him from afar and all of his work. And uh, he's always wanted to face him, dating back to the Cruiserweight Classic when Daniel Bryan was a commentator and he was a competitor. Bryan uh, reciprocates that. He says the exact same thing. He said that he's been watching Drew Gulak for years in WWE, in the Cruiserweight Classic, on the independent scene. And now he finally gets his opportunity to test his skills against him. They also both are very happy that the show has taken place in Philadelphia. Um, I'm not sure if Drew's from Philly or Pittsburgh. I'm pretty sure he's from Philly itself. Unfortunately, despite the fact he was like the hometown guy on this show and the fact that it was a great match, the crowd didn't really get into it at any point, which is a shame because I thought it was the best thing by a wide margin on this entire show. Um, So anyway, we hear from Jonathan Coachman who previews the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view, probably from the pre-show. We hear from Natalia, who talks about she's been a part of a lot of firsts in WWE, including the first ever women's tables match, which is true. At least women's tag team tables match. I don't know about the first ever tables match, period, but definitely the women, the first women's tables match um, at TLC 2010. I think she was a part of the first ever women's ladder match, too, as part of the women's Money in the Bank ladder match in 2017, if I, if I can recall that correctly as well. I think she was. She lost, but she later won the SmackDown Women's Championship. I think it's SummerSlam that year. But anyway, we hear from Daniel Bryan afterward after they recap the great match that he and Drew had. And he says that he had to apologize to Bree on the He says that twice. He's like, oh, I had to apologize to Bree on the phone. And they've brought this up before on like the Bella podcast. And Bryan's brought it up on the bump in exclusive videos on dot com talking about how he beat his body up so much, like the the, the strap match that he had with the Fiend of the Royal Rumble. Like, he has to explain to his kid, Birdie Joe, uh, that, you know, this is what he does for a living, that he's not actually hurt and all this other stuff. Bree hates when he takes bumps like that, and he really almost fucked up his neck in this match. Courtesy of Drew Gulak. They really beat the crap out of each other. But he said that Gulak really pushed him to his limit in this match, and um, he earned his respect, and now they're teaming together, and hopefully if Gulak can beat Nakamura tonight on SmackDown... Brian gets an intercontinental title shot at WrestleMania. So I'm loving the pairing. I'm loving the programming they're having right now. And I said this six months ago. I wrote an article on Bleach Report about feuds I wanted to see on SmackDown post-draft. And that was one of them, Brian and Gulak. And they, breed, they, they, they feuded for a brief bit, and now they're teaming, which is even better. We see the New Day before they make their entrance. We actually see Big E doing the whole New Day entrance from the back. We see Kofi fucking sniffing pancakes, saying that, oh, you can't smell it. You, you can't smell the syrup on the pancakes. But trust me, man, they're on there. So there's that. They recap the SmackDown Tag Team Title Elimination Chamber match, which was great. We hear from uh, Liv Morgan and uh, how she had her face on one of the chairs. I think if not not one of the chairs, but I think it was like the chair they give out in the front row of all the pay-per-views. If you have like ringside seats, you get the like the take-home chair, which is awesome. Um, she kind of goes through the emotions and she gets really emotional talking about how she sees her face on the chair and that's the first time her face has ever really been on anything. And uh, it, it's really cool for her. It's really cool. But now she has to refocus on the match itself and how it's every women for themselves out there, including the Riot Squad. Uh, we hear from Ruby Riot before the match as well. She mentions that Sheena Baszler, actually, when they worked on the indie scene together prior to coming to WWE, I guess this is accurate, I guess this is true, that Baszler punched her in a match and she knocked her jaw right out of place. That is so scary. That is so fucked. Um, so she's obviously intimidated going into this match, having to face Baszler in this matchup. And I think she was tapped out by Baszler within mere minutes in that match. Uh, later on in the night. She also talks about how the Riot Squad is coming full circle in this match, as it was a year ago at Elimination Chamber, that every member of the Riot Squad had a championship opportunity. Remember, uh, like I said earlier, Liv and Sarah went for the WWE, the inaugural WWE Women's Tag Team titles inside the Elimination Chamber, while Ruby Riot, which a lot of people probably forgot about, vied for the Raw Women's Championship against Ronda Rousey. And you probably forgot about it because the match went all of maybe a minute or two, and she lost very decisively. And those two could have had a good match, and it's a shame she got squashed, but what can you do? So she says the match is going to hurt, but she's excited for it nonetheless. 
And Shayna Baszler says, this may not be the biggest match in my career, but it's definitely the most important. I mean, with it being a pay-per-view main event and a Raw Women's Championship opportunity being on the line, I would probably say the same. And they recap the chamber match that Baszler absolutely dominated, as she should have. And then we hear from her afterward, not original comments, but we hear her kind of cut a promo for the WWE cameras that actually aired on Raw the next night, where she put Becky Lynch on notice, called her a bitch, and that was it. So a nice little note to end on there. And uh, yeah, I I very much enjoyed this day of, as always, the episodes are very good. Um, They did make a very slight change with the show. It's no longer WWE Day Of, it's WWE The Day Of. So there's a the in there. Not that it really matters, but just for clarification, if you're looking for it on the WWE Network, um, they actually uploaded all the older episodes as well that I never reviewed because they went to YouTube and not the network. Now it's like a WWE Network exclusive, which is cool. But um, you can relive all the older episodes, which you should, because I don't know if it's filmed by the same person. I'm not 100% sure. But they're a lot shorter. They're only a couple minutes. Like the WrestleMania one last year is like 10 minutes. Um, but they're all very good. This one is about 19 minutes, so a little shorter than the Super Showdown one, but still worth checking out, if only, again, to relive what it was actually like to have a crowd in attendance for a wrestling show. As crazy as that sounds, and if you're listening to this years down the road, you're probably thinking, what the fuck is he talking about? But, uh, yeah, we're in a very weird stage, a weird period right now, where we have no crowds, we have no audiences, so it's kind of nostalgic to look back and watch this show as you know, forgettable or as uneventful as it was, um, to kind of rewatch this and remember, hey, not don't take everything for granted. People were pooping all over the show. Oh, the main event sucked. At least they had a crowd there. It's better than what they're doing right now. So take that for what it's worth. But I enjoyed this day of. Check it out right now on the WWE Network, WWE The Day Of, Elimination Chamber 2020. So thank you guys, as always, for checking out the videos. I appreciate it. Be sure to like the video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more content. I completely forgot to mention this on Hashtag and everything else, but I think we actually recently surpassed, unless the number changed the last time I checked, um, the 4,000 subscriber mark. That's the first time I'm mentioning that here. So uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. We'll have some sort of formal celebration at some point. But then again, I said the same thing for the 3,000 subscriber celebration last year, and we didn't do it. So <laughs> hopefully we could do one before long. But thank you, as always, for checking out the shows, subscribing. Hopefully we can hit that 5,000 subscriber mark um, at some point in the not-so-distant future. Probably won't be too, too soon, but down the road, it's going to be an awesome accomplishment nonetheless. So hope you guys are uh, staying safe, staying clean, washing your hands, hoping to review more network content and stuff like that. Here for the channel to keep you busy. We've had a video go up every single day in 2020. Not looking to break that streak anytime soon. Um, So in the next couple days, bit of a quick preview for you. I know we have WrestleMania next weekend, so I'm not really sure how that's going to work. I'll be busy, so we'll see. But uh, coming up in the next few days, I know this. SmackDown review tomorrow. No matter how dull the show is tonight, I'm still reviewing SmackDown from tonight, tomorrow, here on the channel. And then Sunday, I'll probably have a new... I think I will be putting up my new Dark Side of the Ring review. Not on the Benoit episode, that's coming up at some point. But um, rather the Bruiser Brody episode, I think. Uh, I think I already put up that review too. Maybe not. I don't know if I filmed the new one yet. I think if it wasn't that one... Then I think the Von Eric episode. Yeah, I think my review of the Von Eric episode of the season of the first season from Dark Side of the Ring that'll be up on Sunday. Um, I'm not sure what's new going up on the network this coming week, but um, I should have reviews of the um, gorgeous Gino, uh, not Gino Bravo. I think no, it was Gino Hernandez. Um, that episode from Dark Side of the Ring should be up on Monday or Tuesday, whatever. As well as. What was the other one? The Fabulous Moolah episode. I'll talk about the Benoit episode at some point. I'll be watching and reviewing the season five. I think it's season five premiere of Total Bellas when that goes up on Thursday. A lot to look forward to right here on the channel. No better time to subscribe than right now. So that being said, guys, enjoy the rest of your week slash weekend, depending on when you're listening to this. Have a great one, guys. I'm Graham G.S. and Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.